Hello everyone, welcome to our third keynote presentation. Today we have Julie Lindsay, uh, a, a fantastic educator from Australia. She's going to present a session titled Student Autonomy for Flat Learning and Global Collaboration. A little bit of information about Julie. She is a consultant, presenter, teacher at heart, I'm sure. Um, and she is not only all of those things, she's an Apple Distinguished Educator, a Google Certified Teacher, and she has also received several awards for her contributions to um, ICT education. Julie works mainly now for her own company and is the founder of Flat Connections. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, particularly the Learning Revolution Project. Thank you to Steve for your constant support of the Australia E-Series. Um, the Australia E-Series volunteers are the people who are bringing you Aussie Live. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do behind the scenes and we're very, very pleased with the presentations we've been able to bring to you this year. We'd also like to thank Blackboard Collaborate because without Blackboard Collaborate we couldn't have the sessions. Okay, so just to get started, we'd like you to grab a little icon and show us where you are. Now, Julie and I are pretty much in the same place most of the time <laughs> because um, even though we are world worldly people and, and travel a lot, we actually only live generally about 15 minutes from each other, so it's quite quite unusual and I, I had the privilege of meeting Julie not long ago. So for those people who, oh sorry, these are tools, there you go. Hopefully everyone can now add their little icon. I hadn't activated the tool, sorry about that. So we've got someone over in New York. That's Sarah, welcome Sarah from all the way over there. A few people from down in Victoria. Oh, someone from California, I think. Lovely. My spreading stuff in Victoria. Lovely. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. I'd like to. Oh, Phoenix, Arizona. Sorry, Peggy. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Not very good at geography. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'd like to um, hand over to Julie now and let her take us on a journey through global collaboration with students. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Ness, and welcome, everybody. It's great to be here. It's a stunning Saturday morning here up on the northern uh, New South Wales coast, Northern Rivers area where I live. And uh, thank you so much to Ness and other organisers of the uh, of the live online conference. This is such a great idea and you know it's just wonderful that we have people in the room who are interested and go from one session to the next and I really appreciate your attendance. Alright, so I've got a few things I want to say today. I'm trying to put them into order. Uh, some new ideas that I want to present. I know some people in the room have heard me present a few times before and uh, I just, you know, I love interacting with you and I do have se uh, sections in my presentation where I do want your responses as well. Uh, so that we can sort of build something together here. But basically I'm looking at student autonomy or you may actually prefer the word student agency. They're almost interchangeable but I chose the word autonomy for this uh, flat learning and global collaboration. Uh, that's me of course, Ness just did a wonderful introduction. One uh, uh, couple of things I'd like to add is I am doing my educational doctorate. I'm just about to have my research proposal approved hopefully in two weeks time with the University of uh, Southern Queensland. And I'm also an adjunct lecturer at the Charles Sturt University and I'm just about to start two subjects in their master's degree for knowledge management and digital innovation. So a, a big virtual wave out there to some of my students across Australia and across the world. Looking forward to interacting with you next week. Alright, so flat learning, global collaboration, student autonomy, what does this all mean? Let's say, and this is some of my slides have got a bit of text on today because I didn't want to sort of miss some, some key ideas here. So apologies in advance, I've tried to make it a little user friendly. So I'm, I'm looking at how we can develop student autonomy to build learning networks 
and what I call communities of practice. Well, what Etienne Wenger talk, calls uh, communities of practice as well. Uh, uh, that's uh, if you want to look up any of the research that he's done, his surname is Wenger, uh, in terms of building communities of practice for collaboration. And I look at it from the um, uh, local and going from local to global. Yeah, good point, Peggy. Okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, we can come back to that. Uh, I'm trying to give people sort of a handle on where they might fit into this presentation. But certainly, show, send me a, a link if you can find something that disputes that. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we talk about the teacher of the connectors and collaborative global learner. Um, but what, from my point of view, I think we need to redesign the learning paradigm. And we need to connect students in K-12 more independently. And I'm particularly looking, of course, at the middle school, high school students. Uh, and we need to look at the role. Um, yeah, okay, thanks, thanks Peggy. Uh, I will keep interacting with the chat window. This is the style I would like to adopt for this presentation. So that's fine. Keep putting things in the back channel. And I appreciate your involvement and your thoughts as I go through. So I'm looking at the role of the teacher as an activator, or what I call learning concierge. And uh, also this, you know, asking the student to take responsibility for, for professional learning modes and not be reliant on the teacher as the conduit. And I've got some examples and some further ideas uh, to share with you. So let's start off. There's three sections of the presentation. So, you know, what is flat learning? What is a flat student? And I like this. Um, diagram of the map because you know the old days. <laughs> Remember the old days when you'd go on a trip in the car and it would always end up as an argument as to who's navigating and how you got there and why you were up the wrong street and you're trying to flick through the, well in Melbourne we had the Melways being, coming from Victoria and it was just often a disaster and these days it's so much easier with our GPS systems but, but I like that, you know, the idea the map was flat, the map, sorry, was flat. Uh, in terms of paper, but it wasn't actually flat in terms of being able to access the, access the information. Now, of course, with our GPS systems and our online uh, ability as we travel, uh, the learning in that respect is now flat because we're connected, uh, but uh, it's, it's now a lot easier. So having now totally confused you, let's keep going. So what I mean by flat learning is that all learners have the freedom to communicate across rather than up or down. So uh, we are able to connect with people horizontally rather than the, the vertical. And I'm bringing back this slide. Uh, I was just in touch with David Woolley again recently for the, the book I'm writing on, The Global Educator. And <clears throat> this goes back uh, quite a way. And uh, I take my hat off to David for really raising this before we uh, even coined the term flat classroom in 2006. When David talks about, you know, how do we drive the learning when we can no longer rely on gravity? Where do we get the energy? So we need to build in new forms of energy when, in fact, the learning isn't hierarchical. The teacher does not have all the knowledge. The students do not look up to the teacher. It's not, uh, you know, essentially a one-way didactic system, or it shouldn't be for a lot of the learning that we do. Uh, so. You know, if our classrooms are flat, what are we doing? What does flat learning look like? And of course, it's uh, supported by digital access and fluency, and this, uh, this is how we get our flat connected learning. So a couple of different ideas here to sort of get us thinking even more about this, this whole idea of synchronous flat learning. On the left is a student working uh, in a workshop I ran in Mumbai who is connecting with one of her team members who is a student sitting in Japan. So they're actually connecting in synchronous time through probably Skype, actually. They're on Skype and then they're adding stuff to a wiki. Uh, but they're working virtually in synchronous time. So I call that an example of flat learning. And of course, the, uh, the picture on the right is a typical sort of class-to-class uh, -class Skype call. I think that's actually Anne's class from uh, Victoria from a while ago when they were doing this with Skype. And then, of course, we have asynchronous flat learning. And this is where we start to look at our blended learning modes. Uh, the students on the left are working, uh, actually, I think that boy's actually working on a video there, but they're, they're putting together material to share in an asynchronous format, create an artifact, a piece of multimedia, upload it, uh, and it becomes something that other people can then access and comment on and co-comment on, etc. 
on the right there, of course, is a discussion or an activity list actually from one of the NINGs that I run, one of the student NINGs or educational networks uh, where different things are happening. So Maddie posted a, uh, commented on a video, uh, Luke posted a status, uh, Audrey commented on her own uh, blog post, uh, someone else posted a video, etc. So there's this constant stream of activity going on uh, within that educational network in an asynchronous format. So this diagram uh, helps to explain further how I view flat connected learning uh, and the other, some of the other terms, only some of them, that we, we use um, in 21st century learning. So things like blended learning and flipped learning, I see flipped learning as a, as a form of blended learning. Uh, they're, they're really subsets or, or, or not so much, they're so smaller than the flat connected learning. Flat connected learning is the big superset uh, that really connects all of these together. Project challenge based, collaborative sharing, inquiry based, etc. And for all of these to work, we need we need strong leadership for education, we need innovative pedagogy, we need uh, futuristic learning design, and we really need to look at how Web 2.0 supports all of this as well, as we have been doing for many years now. <laughs> Sorry, Peggy, I just saw your flat Stanley. Your flat Stanley is a, a little different, yes. I just want to bring in some other ideas here. I've been, been reading quite a bit of Steve Wheeler's work lately. He's based in the UK. Uh, he's, uh, he works at the university level. <clears throat> but um, he talks about uh, this learning 2.0. And of course, we really know, um, and thank you, which, uh, virtual wave to Steve Harbiden. Uh, and colleagues, um, Lucy Gray there, of course, as well, Global Education Conference and, and all that Steve does with Learning 2.0. And I'm thinking more, of course, at the student level here where Learning 2.0 means that it needs to, the learning needs to be participatory. It needs to rely on interaction with other learners. And it's not what you know necessarily, but who you know. So think about, you know, in your own classes with your own students, is, is, is your learning now moving towards Learning 2.0? in a, not just in your class, but beyond your class as well. And then Steve talks a lot about learning 3.0 and this whole um, semantic based web, um, uh, web 3.0 can also be called um, user and machine generated and just new ways of thinking and learning and accessing uh, networked uh, opportunities more. So Steve actually says, this is a quote, oops, I forgot the end quote marks there, but it is a quote from Steve Wheeler, and that's the URL it came from. So he says, uh, if Web 1.0 was the right web and Web 2.0 is the read and write web, then Web 3.0 will be the read, write, collaborate web. And of course, you know, I'm, I do like the word collaborate, uh, and we need to get to come to a better understanding of that as well. But he's saying, or well, not only promote learning that is more richly collaborative, it will also enable learners to come closer to any time, any place learning and provide intelligent solutions to web searching, document management and organisation of content. So, you know, we talk about any time, any place learning largely these days in terms of the device that we have in our hand and this, this move in the last 10 years to one-to-one -one learning, mobile learning, any time, any place learning. Uh, and it has been a, a big push, and with schools have, have embraced digital devices and technology in so many different ways, so many exciting ways. But we still need to go some extra steps. Um, Peggy, you're absolutely right. There is quite a bit of collaboration going on with Web 2.0. Yes, and I think uh, Steve actually encourages comments on his blog, and I think that he's not necessarily discounting that. I think it's really this next level that we need to go to uh, in terms of this any time, any place and not con confined or contained to the local but taking it to the global as well. And that's really my message today as well. So, you know, we've had our push for devices, we've had our push for technology but still going on, still a lot of schools and countries are trying to catch up and looking at budgets, etc. Um, thanks, Peggy, for that. Uh, but there's still there, there has to be more. There has to be more in terms of pedagogy and uh, innovative learning modes to use the devices. Steve so talked about the next generation learning as well in terms of putting it into this type of chart. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, 
the it's interesting his classification mode. There is no such word as rhizonomy, but <laughs> I think he's made that one. But there is a word rhizomone, riz, or some, something that talks about roots going out and spreading out further. So I'm still investigating that one thinking about it. So I encourage you to investigate this as well. <clears throat> but it is a clever chart that Steve has put together there, uh, showing, trying to show the differences. So not only is le are learning modes collaborative, they're also social and community based. So that's probably a, a clearer distinction there. Networked, multimodal, multidirectional, etc. Okay, now keep going here. And then of course we've got George Siemens with his connectivism theories and um, Stephen Downs is in part, not in partnership directly, but they've written a lot in the last 10 years about connectivism and the pipe being more important than the content in the pipe. Uh, and the fact that, you know, through network, through being a node on a network and connecting to other nodes on the network, we can build knowledge together uh, through connected learning. And this is such an important concept for people to understand uh, before they start to, um, well, as they start to implement more connected learning modes for students. So we look at, you know, what are enablers of flat learning? Uh, access to Web 2.0 tools, access at home and at school. Uh, we still uh, continue to be challenged by uh, lack of access. I was just running a workshop yesterday down in Sydney with a group of teachers from different, uh, I think we had about three or four different states there from Australia and delighted to hear that New South Wales uh, Education Department have opened up Google Apps. Uh, for their teachers within their portal, which is a, a great step, I think. Uh, but you know, the question is, what else? What else can they access? And what if the students can't get on here? And you know, you've really got to start to. You always have always had to explore and find things. One of the great successes. Um, in fact, I'll give you a peek into what we did. Um, let me just put this in the window. One of, one of the great successes we had yesterday at this workshop uh, was using Padlet as sort of a back channel, there you go, there's a Padlet from yesterday, you can have a peek into that, uh, using Padlet as a back channel to connect learners. And we had uh, 20 Indonesian teachers and 20 Australian teachers at the workshop. So, so you know, these uses of Web 2.0 tools suddenly take on a whole new light when it, it, um, it be, there becomes a real purpose for, well, how are we going to share ideas and connect? And, and then we want people back in our home schools to see what we're doing in this workshop as well. Um, so that's that. So uh, you know, use of Web 2.0 tools, being able to access them. Uh, curriculum redesign is so important, and that's a whole other webinar. Um, being able to promote the network student, you know, not just the network teacher. Uh, and I take my hat off to Wendy Drexler. You may know Wendy. She's working for ISTE at the moment, actually. Uh, she did her study, her PhD, on the network student, and she's got some wonderful. Has it didn't work? Ah. Oh, sorry, it should say AEF Bridge, I think. Hang on, hang on let me just check that. Uh, Wendy Drexler, if you Google, sorry, AEF Bridge. Ah, put AEF Bridge on the end of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would be better. Um, look at some of Wendy's work. She's got some great work there in terms of promoting students and networking themselves, okay? So I'm trying to talk and write at the same time here. I'm not doing a very good job of it. There we go. Um, so student development of personal learning networks and professional learning communities. Personal branding for students, global digital citizenship. These all go hand in hand with students starting to take, um, their students starting to be autonomous in their own learning. Uh, and then of course student independent learning, having choices, being able to choose uh, their learning pathways and independent collaboration that is not always teacher managed or always teacher directed. And these are such important enablers, uh, what I call enablers, of uh, flat learning. Now I want to just talk about uh, John Hattie. John Hattie is a New Zealander who's now back in Australia, or an Australian who went to New Zealand and now he's back. Please correct me if I've got that wrong. Uh, he's done some research, uh, of course, on um, Uh, he's, he's, he put out he's put out some information or some research on visible learning. He, he looked at a synthesis of over 800 meta-analysis in education. So it's an amazingly large, complex 
piece of work and he's, he's written a lot of things. So John John Hattie is his name. Uh, oh, thank you, thanks, Peggy. So he's looking at you know the uh, the influences on good learning, influences on learning, and he looks at this ES on the right hand column. Is the effect size? What is the effect size? That's the one I was just looking at, Peggy. Great. Oh, excellent, Sheila. Thank you so much for that. That's great. So yeah, these are and the, this is sort of uh, the top. 20 to 29 top. I just put these in because uh, 23 is cooperative versus individual individualistic learning. 0.59. So the higher the point number there, the the, the larger the effect, positive effect on learning. So you've got problem solving, teaching, etc., etc. Et I've only got a couple of these here, and this is his top 10. This is what he calls his top 10 in terms of the effect size, uh, influence, the influences on. Um, on learning, so I encourage you to have a look at his work and to to um, I'm certainly not an expert on John Hattie's work, but I I do uh, encourage you to have a look at it. Sorry, Carol, is my audio dropping, or is it okay, or is your audio dropping? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll keep going until someone tells me they can't hear me. Okay, I'm back. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so I want to just pause for 90 seconds. And I'm going to put the timer on. And I want you to write in the chat here now, um, how connected are you as an educator? How are you connecting your students to the world? All right. Uh, so I'm going to put the, the chat, the timer on, starting now. And I would love to hear your responses. What are you doing to connect your students to the world? Do you have a blog? Do you have a wiki? something in the chat window. What do you do to really connect yourself as an educator? We can all start sharing our Twitter handles as well. Content curation, there is that in the classroom. Global read aloud. Mm -hmm. Connecting to various networks. Great. Okay, what about your students? Would be global read aloud classes around the world. Yep. Uh, Janita, uh, we use a website of resources and we have a Google group, but our learners are senior tutors. Oh, okay, so you're at that level. Google Hangouts and Skype for mystery location calls. And Ness is doing things with her students' web page, Twitter, etc. Okay, there's some uh, some interesting things going on there. Okay, we've just about taken our 90 seconds. Thank you for contributing. I'm going to keep moving here. So I'm going to move into the next section. Thank you. Time up. Uh, global collaboration. I love this picture. I subscribe to um, uh, different things that, that bring wonderful Creative Commons images into my mailbox. Which <laughs> you're probably saying, I wish you had a few more images instead of all that text on the slides. Sorry about that. Uh, this one is wonderful because I think you know we we aren't lighthouses. As, as teachers, we we can be a beacon of light for our students, but we shouldn't be isolated like a light lighthouse is. So there's a there's a mixed sort of message here in this this lighthouse um, image. All right, I just want to define global collaboration so that we know, or well, you know, um, yeah, sure, Peggy, um, remind me and I'll tweet some out, I'll t send an email, I'll tweet it out to you, sure. So global collaboration, the way I view it, is that um, we have geographically dispersed educators, classrooms, schools and other learning environments that use online technologies. They learn with others beyond their immediate environment. And this, of course, supports curricular objectives, intercultural understandings, critical thinking, personal and social capabilities, and ICT capabilities. Right? So that's, that's the broad definition. We are talking about, when I talk about global collaboration, I talk about it as an online, technology-infused learning uh, objective. And I know there are other types of global collaboration. Of course, before we had technology 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, there was no technology infused global collaboration, but now there is and that's what I talk about, that's what I do. So, you know, flat learning uh, is, does include 
collaboration online. So we need to think about how are we supporting this and how can we take this from the local to the global. And I, I always say there are three easy steps and I'm not going to detail each of these steps, but in terms of developing flat learning, developing the flat students, going from the local to the global, we need to build online learning communities. We need to design learning for success. Uh, it's very rare that you can suddenly turn up to school and say, oh, we're going to do global collaboration today. Uh, you may be able to turn up to school and, and on the spot create a, a mystery Skype, uh, but then what's next? And mystery Skypes need to lead to something that goes a lot deeper in terms of interaction and collaboration. And once we've designed these learning experiences, we need to make sure that we move from collaboration to co-creation. And you know, what are the students making together? What are they creating together? What are they discussing from opposite sides of the world? What are they building together in terms of building understanding, building artifacts, building documents that show uh, cu different cultural inputs, etc. Just a quick word about the evolution of, of global collaboration and um, this is important because it's really the global collaboration 3.0 uh, that I'm talking about and you know something like um, perhaps perhaps a mystery Skype is at the 1.0 level uh, which is fine. I think a classroom should have all of these different levels across the academic year. There should be uh, curriculum and learning design that supports all of these different uh, levels, uh, but we, I see, I think classrooms often miss out on the 3.0 level at this stage because they're not confident or they don't um, know how to do it or they can't find partners, like-minded partners that will help them uh, build knowledge together and share with the world, etc. So try and think about, you know, aiming for that global collaboration 3.0 and finding something. I just want to share this with, with you. This is one of the Flat Connections projects uh, that we do. This is the high school project. I just want to share a little bit of information with you just to, uh, as an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a project from um, a year ago, actually, that I want to focus on where we had all of these, all these numbers, 500 students, etc., who created 213 videos and 15 e-books, etc., etc. Um, so how did we organise these students? Well, we put them into mixed classroom teams. And we had this uh, community of practice, you know, teachers and judges and researchers, etc., uh, involved in this uh, ongoing 12-week collaboration. So you can see immediately, of course, that this uh, global collaboration did take, or does, has taken quite a bit of design. The design um, has evolved um, over the years as well. The project, the new project for this one, just kicked off two weeks ago, and we've got. 300 students, just over 300 students, and once again, six countries. We're delighted to welcome Lebanon uh, to the project uh, this semester as well, which is great. So that's how we're doing that. And students are build, we're building a community network, network, and for the high school pro this project, I do use a Ning uh, because they are, they are older students, and uh, it's actually um, it's an open Ning. I'm just going to put the the link there because it's probably easier for you to type and find it on the browser. FlatConnectionsGlobalProject.net. I think that will get you there. Um, so we build a community. That's the one. Yeah. And uh, then we we build collaborative learning and we interact and share with the world. So just a couple of screenshots. So the, the, this is the Flat Connections Global Project. Uh, the students have an opportunity to chat, and they do chat across the world. Uh, that was a screenshot from a chat from last year. Uh, they do share their multimedia. Um, so we uh, we just had an incident a few hours ago. Actually, there was um, some students from a class in the USA chatting, and they were they were being a bit silly. They were sort of sharing some links to YouTube that were. And not um, inappropriate links necessarily, just just rubbish links and had nothing to do with why they were on the link. So I just stepped in and said, hi, I'm a teacher in the project. Um, do you know what you're meant to be doing, etc. And uh, they said, oh, no. So I said, well, you're meant to be doing this, this. And they said, oh, OK, thanks. So anyway, the teacher then emailed me. She said, oh, I'm so sorry about my students in the chat window. And I think I should suspend some of them. And I said, no, no, no. 
are you not a bank? I said, no, don't suspend them. This is a learning curve for them. They don't know how to learn in this online social educational network. So, and they certainly weren't being necessarily inappropriate. They were just being teenagers. Uh, so she's going to talk about netiquette in her Monday morning class. Uh, but certainly, you know, I, I discourage um, the fear factor in terms of, oh, I better suspend them because they don't know what they're doing. Well, they won't know what they're doing if they don't get an opportunity to try it again. So I do encourage people to consider, you know, um, when you do take students into something like a Ning or Edmodo is another great tool which isn't public, of course. This Ning is completely public and I, I do that on a, pur for pur on a purpose, <laughs> sorry, for a purpose, so that the high school students do get the real world um, um, opportunity to learn while being public. Uh, but, you know, it's no... They have to learn, and some mistakes are made sometimes, and uh, it's all a learning curve. All right, so that's the thing. And then we move on to a wiki, and we have Google Docs linked from the wiki, of course. And once again, it's it's finding your place within this this community and finding your team members and, and then working out how you're going to collaborate and co-create things together. That is the, the amazing challenge of this project. I also, I, I brought this project in because um, this project focuses on student leaders as well. And this is a screenshot um, of the student leadership uh, or student leader meeting this time last year. And I just had another one yesterday that I wasn't able to attend. But uh, students come in and uh, we had about 70 leaders last project. I think we've got about 40 in this project. They come in and they meet once a week in a synchronous virtual room. Uh, this is actually using a tool called Fuse, F-U-Z-E dot com. And they talk about the project and uh, you can see there are some teachers in there as well. And they talk about um, how to support their teams. They are leaders of teams in this project. So um, there are students in there. The, the girls in the blue dresses with the white collars, they're uh, from Steve Madsen's class. He's based in Canberra. So that we had Australia, uh, some of the other students from the USA, etc. And I think for all of the students in these projects, it is it's always the first time they've ever done something like this. And the students I was chatting with uh, uh, earlier today on the NIM, they said they'd never had the opportunity to do anything like this before where they had to represent their school themselves and connect and collaborate beyond their classroom walls. So, you know, this is why I think these types of projects are so important. Uh, particularly at this level, but they're also important at, with, uh, for much younger students as well to get them used to these global connections and get them used to taking some sort of, um, as I say, autonomy in their own learning. And this leadership approach is what we do as well. I surveyed the student leaders at the end of, of that project um, and these are some of the responses I got. And I think they're really interesting because these are the same uh, frustrations that teachers have in the project as well. This feeling of um, uh, difficulties with communication, difficulties with um, people not contacting them or, or connecting and do it and following through. Um, that one in green, but how, however, saying that there were also other students who contributed significant amounts of information, etc. So this um, this feeling of imbalance and it's hard to know. Uh, where, why this is so, are the students not understanding the project? Have the teachers not explained the project? Do the students just not want to contribute? And, you know, there's so much more research we need to do on this. And the research, my focus of my doctorate is actually not on the students. I'm not researching students. I'm actually researching um, teachers. So I'm not going to get to the bottom of this necessarily <laughs> in the next two years. But, but I do encourage people who are thinking about doing any research to you know, keep digging, keep finding out what is going on here. Um, and there's more comments here. I like this one. One student said it was like herding cats. <laughs> so so um, you know, having that um, challenge to bring together, once again, students from different countries asynchronously. Yes, Katrina, thank you. Chiefs and Indians problems has been around a long time. You're absolutely right. And what a great opportunity for students to experience this. Uh, so just more comments there. Uh, once again, communication problems. Feeling that you're, do you're the only one doing the work, etc. And just 
how do you really get to the, this real communication where you, you feel that you're on the same wavelength? And I think students are struggling with this despite what we've set up. Um, and this um, comment, one of the um, I've got students, schools from the Berea district in Ohio in the project and uh, students who've been in the project and then go on to the next grade level and the next grade level come back and they said to their teacher, you know, when I'm not connecting globally I feel disconnected because that's the only time in, in the whole high school career of this particular student and others as well actually where they do get to do this global connection one semester for their whole high school which is certainly not good enough in my view but at least it's something, at least they've got some teachers who are giving them this opportunity in their school. So, okay, 90 second challenge. What do teachers need to know then to be able to support this type of connected learning and global collaboration and what are you doing? What are you doing, if anything, to bring this to your classroom? So I'm going to put the timer on, there we go. So perhaps we could come up with a list. What do we need to know to bring global collaboration to the classroom? What do you need to know? If you're think, sitting there thinking, well, I don't know what she's talking about. I need to know this. I think actually that second one's probably very similar to what I asked you before. What are you doing to bring? But, um, Yeah, how to communicate clearly, clearly ways. Next says, are students ready and capable of connecting? And that's the question, really. And Katrina says, how engaged do you find students are in Australia when students are usually in other time zones and not available during class times? Katrina, that is such an interesting question and comment. And I think the fact that we are in a difficult time zone, not difficult for Asia, but difficult for Europe and USA, I find that to be a challenge, but once again, remember, asynchronous. It's really about asynchronous. How to listen actively, that's great, Carol. Yeah, are teachers ready and capable? Okay, so we don't, you know, this is it. These are the questions. Are students ready? Are teachers ready? And Sarah says we need to understand how to guide students working in groups and consider cultural differences. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you so much. That excellent points there. Appreciate your, your input there. All right, let's move on to the next section where I'm going to talk about this whole piece about student autonomy. Um, so perhaps one definition is the level of control, autonomy and power that a student experiences in an educational situation. Right, if we're trying to get our head around what this means. Uh, thoughts on student agency. Now this is coming from, um, there's a link there. This is actually coming from a university website. So just, just to give you some, some resources to explore as well. Um, okay, level of control, etc. Oh, that's this quote I just had. Giving students choices, authentic assessment, experiential or project based learning, mastery based learning. So this is all, all in the mix here. It's all in our mix. Um, there's this interesting, re this is a research article that you might like to explore, School on Cloud towards a paradigm shift. And they're talking about this, you know, it's in the EU, in the European Union there. And they're talking about new teaching and learning paradigm based on the integrated dimension of education. Uh, considering the, the use of cloud computing, there's a need for an integrated approach. So we need to look at it in terms of uh, pedagogic, technical, administrative, social, political and cultural. So all of these must be looked at uh, in order for us to actually create this paradigm shift uh, to build student autonomy. So if we look at our, what we call our normal school, so schooling at the moment, um, and I'll just, I just love getting out and doing workshops with Australian teachers at the moment because I'm learning so much more about what's happening in Australia. Um, being out of having been out of Australia for 15 years, uh, I just get a, bit, a little bit out of touch and more <laughs> more in touch perhaps with the global perspective, which I don't want to lose either. Um, but if normal school is not supporting students' autonomy for global connections, what alternatives exist now? So if we look at, uh, you know, oh, well, my my son, my daughter, whatever, is not getting this in a normal school, 
What else can they do? Virtual schooling, homeschooling, blended learning, distance education. What, what are the options? Take your typical 16-year-old. What could they do? Just some examples here. I'm sure, um, please put other examples in the window. I know there are lots of USA examples. Uh, that we could explore, but I particularly defined this to uh, Australian examples just for this presentation. But there's some that I found um, that are out there encouraging students to learn virtually. Um, a couple of them are using Moodle. Uh, they're mostly related to uh, what would I would call normal subjects. So you can go to geography, you can do history, you can do English, mathematics. Uh, you can do your VCE or HSC, uh, which is the uh, high school certificate uh, subjects, through these virtual schools. So they are great alternatives for students, not particularly um, creative alternatives in terms of giving choices for students below the senior school certificate. Uh, but maybe maybe there are some subjects they do which that provide uh, different things. But um, if you know anything else, please put it in the window. And then of course there's the um, we need to look at this whole tool-based approach. Um, uh, EduOnGo is an interesting one I was looking at. Canvas, I've actually created stuff in Canvas. Moodle, others. So you know, if we are looking at building something like this, what would we use? And this is this is what some people are using. But does it really do the job? You know, when I show you that example of having a Ning and a Wiki, uh, even though it does use two tools, which often confuses teachers, oh, why can't we just have one tool? I've never found one tool that does the whole job that I need, and um, that's from years of experience. So, so how do we foster the student agency or autonomy? How do we give students cho choices? How do we provide opportunities? That's the question. Uh, just another example you might like to explore: Albany, uh, let me say, Albany Senior High School in New Zealand. Uh, I was at a research day last weekend. Uh, where a teacher was talking from the school. I've actually been to this school. I, I was helping Mark Wagner run a, a, a Google Apps for Education conference at this school last year. It is a wonderful school and they're doing e-portfolios and do, doing great things. So have a look at that as well. Um, also going back to Hattie, <coughs> uh, this whole idea of visible learning. Um, the impact on student learning when you uh, set challenging and specific goals that allow them to direct, evaluate and redirect their learning and receive feedback from peers. And receiving feedback was one of the, uh, the uh, high um, impact percentages that he had there as well. So, but one of the barriers to student uh, agency or autonomy, school structures, timetables, this constant sort of moving from one place to the next every hour or so, Curriculum objectives, having perhaps too narrow a curriculum objectives. Assessment requirements, uh, a common uh, standardised testing of course perhaps is another barrier. And then of course we get all of these attitudinal uh, uh, barriers. Even student attitudes, uh, which are interesting. And once again, um, I don't have time to go into research or, or go too deeply in that, but just that of course there are some attitudinal barriers. Uh, and we need to look at the role of the teacher, you know, the teacher as a change agent, the teacher is an enabler, not a barrier. Uh, the teacher must have a range of learning strategies, be able to provide feedback, be a visibly, uh, a visible learner themselves, be an activator, not a facilitator. And I'm getting this word once again, John Hattie uh, has provided this, this whole idea of being an activator rather than a facilitator. And I do like um, this chart that he's put together in terms of the um, the effect size of the activator, what he calls the activator um, actions. Oh, great, Peggy. Thank you. Great link to the recording that Steve, Steve did uh, with, uh, with John Hattie on it. Yeah, great. So I'm tending to use this word more now. Rather than, I used to use facilitator. I, I like the word facilitator, but I'm tending to use this word activator more now. Um, in terms of still having, and I don't like the word control, but, but perhaps knowing more about what you're doing to manage the learning for the student, to make sure that they, you do support their autonomy. Great. Oh, that's great, Penny. Thanks. 
Okay, right, 90 second challenge, I'll put the timer on. Is the teacher the barrier to student autonomy or agency? What ideas do you have to remove the barriers so that learning can be flat and global? Maybe you totally disagree with me. I welcome your input into the chat window. And if, if the teacher is the barrier, is there a reason for that? Coming, going back to some of our, you know, is it the school structure, is it the system? I can see you're all writing there, great. Good point, Sarah, yes. Just why they always have no trouble taking ownership of new ways to do things here. We are running out of time. I'm actually going to um, keep writing your, your comments. I'm going to keep going here. Um, I'm going to talk about teachers and social change because I'm obviously talking too slowly. <laughs> I've got too much in here. So think about this, you know, paradigm shift to constructive teaching modes using online technologies, collaborative practices, etc. Great comments and co-comment as well as I keep moving through these slides. I do want to get to the end of this. So this is part of my research coming up actually in the next two years. The, 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 um, the influences of social change and the explicit outputs of social change. You know, this whole new, new practices for personal pedagogy, um, etc., etc. And You'll get these slides, you, you can come back and have a look at this. But, you know, the things we are seeing, we're seeing community building, we're seeing collaboration that leads to co-creation, we're seeing pedagogical independence and leadership for change within a school. And the research is, is telling us, though, that um, the, the adaption or the adoption of technology uh, is really at low-level tasks. Teachers feel pressured. Uh, when they feel pressured to change their pedagogy, uh, they're more likely to resist adopting technology altogether. So we still have this constant struggle uh, with this, uh, you know, embracing technology and using it in a ubiquitous and uh, constructivist way. And you know, in terms of global learning and collaboration, uh, we fi we're finding still that teachers are embracing global collaboration. The types of projects that I'm talking about with the Flat Connections project, tr mainly through personal commitment rather than a formal curriculum or requirement. And often they go out on a limb, they, um, uh, the, the school doesn't necessarily support them, it's more of a personal choice. And once again, I don't think this is good enough across the schools that I'm seeing who are in fact embracing, you know, spending so much money on technology. Uh, what are they doing it for, just to word process and do spreadsheets? I'm not sure <laughs> at the moment. So, you know, there's implications for policymakers and teacher preparation programs as well. So, I want to move now, just in the last five minutes. I did the Google Certified Teacher uh, sessions last year in September, um, and I was the first class in the world to actually do the two-day course using the new design, which has been influenced by Ewan McIntosh, uh, notosh.com. I don't know if you know Ewan McIntosh. Um, he wasn't actually there, but um, his colleagues, uh, Tom Barrett and Hamish Curry, were there running this workshop. It was a wonderful workshop. But basically, we had to come up with a, um, a moonshot. So my moonshot, and we had to do a how might we statement. So my moonshot for this was how might we flatten the learning environment to include connected and collaborative practices for learners everywhere in order to deepen understanding about the world. And this is really what I've just been talking about. And we had to do a hexagonal sort of um, thing there, and you can see that one sort of sort of in the middle where it says flatten learning. That's I should have put a gold star on. That was actually meant to be the centre of my hexagon arrangement there. So I want to flatten learning, and then all these ideas have come come out of it. And it's actually a really good activity to do. Grab a whole lot of hexagons, write things on them, and work out how it all fits together and and what you need. Uh, so you can have a look at that. And it's a great staff activity. Put your staff into teams and do it. 
And then I sort of, you know, this is me brainstorming. You see the coffee cup on the right there, the laptop, and we, we, we brainstormed and we walked around and read everybody else's brainstorm as well. So just to show you that this was actually a two-day process um, and trying to think, well, okay, I've got my statement. What am I going to do with it? I'm keeping moving here. That's, that's my team, Team Giant Link, um, educated from across Australia, and Matt, Matt was actually our, um, our team leader from New Zealand there. So I've come up with this idea of learning collaboratively. So you're thinking, where's this all come from? Where's it going to? So this whole idea of student autonomy. Um, if the teacher is the barrier, I want the students to be able to join and create learning collaboratives. And these are meant to support student passion and choices in learning. Global teams, learning concierge support, I'll come to that in a minute, uh, have a design thinking structure. And our students can join these learning collaboratives independently, or schools can of course say, well, I want my class to be part of this. That's also okay. Or schools might say, well, I've got a few, we've got a few students in grade nine or ten, perhaps, who are a little bit out on a limb. They don't, you know, they don't quite fit in here. We'd like them to do something different. So maybe that's where they fit in. So that's uh, so. Really, I see this as an alternative approach to school. It can run parallel with traditional schooling, uh, but it's basically a redesign of the learning paradigm. Whereas I want students to take the lead in connecting and collaborating and co-creating and co-creating solutions to global problems. And that, that may say, sound very sort of lofty, but uh, you know, students, this is possible. Uh, so where's the teacher going to get started? Good question. Okay, what have I got here? I'll just, I'm coming to that, Mel. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm talking about you know, learning concierges, of course, are the are teachers or other teachers of these students or other interested parties, or they could be parents. So once again, a flat learning environment. Um, and of course, the learning concierge does support the, and monitor the students at all times. The first one that we're going to pilot starts in April this year, and it's actually a, a, a language learning collaborative. So it's really based on the language and culture of China, and it's called Connect with China. If you go to myflatconnections.com, website, uh, you'll find it there under flat learning. And this is, um, we're just about to rev up and send out information again in terms of inviting people to, to come in and be part of this. And we are calling it a pilot. Um, uh, I'm in uh, partnership with uh, Katie Grubb who works for the New South Wales Department of Education as a distance learning educator and she's actually, she won a grant, she's going to China during April this year. So she will be the person on the ground, so to speak, uh, connecting uh, some of the Chinese participants in this collaborative with people who are not exactly in China. So there's a lot of information up on the website about that, but that's our first plan, to build this sort of learning collaborative where students can come in and uh, explore and find out about Chinese language and culture. Another one I want to build is uh, a social entrepreneurship learning collaborative. And this is, I'm planning to launch this in September, so keep your eyes open for this one. So it's really a one semester opportunity, uh, but you know, once you're in the community, you will always be in it, and if you, you can keep, you know, keep that community connection and learning going, even though the collaborative program itself will go for one semester. Um, so we want to, you know, look at design thinking to foster problem identification, ideation, prototype development, feedback, and iteration, and social entrepreneurship is such an amazing. Um, uh, topic to be working on. Okay, I'm just about finished here. Very quickly, three things to take away. Learning doesn't happen in isolation. Students must connect for flat learning. And we must shift content to context. So it's really the context of learning that is so important if you want to take the local to the global and you want to be connected and collaborative learners. And we probably don't have time for questions. Sorry, yes. And that's some of the information about what I do. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for your comments. I'm going to go through and read everyone's comments in more detail. Um, uh, thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> As always, fantastic. And we have to be hard to fit, fit things in. There have been lots of questions and ideas throughout the chat. And the chat was very, very active. So I really thank everyone for being here today and I really want to thank Julie because every time I listen to you speak, Julie, there's always something new I'm learning about and I really am looking forward to your research, um, it's for your doctorate, seeing, seeing what you take from that and the sharing that you do with that because it's an area 
I have some interest in, so I'm looking forward to seeing where that takes you. Thanks, Ned. It's been great to be here and uh, have a wonderful conference, everyone. This is truly a wonderful event. Thank you, Ness, uh, for organising this. Thanks, Julie. For those people who want to save the slides from the presentation, if you go to File, Save Whiteboard, and just change the um, file type to PDF, you can um, save the slides and go back. And the recording will be available after um, the conference. So thank you, everyone.